This morning so far, we've come together, we've lifted up His name, we've seen people ministered to, genuine needs in our house, people prayed for with faith connected together. And then as one voice, unified as one body, we lifted up the name of Jesus. There is nothing better than that moment. I'm so glad we could share it together, church. Oh, I love the presence of God here in the house. And this morning we're about to gather around the Word of God as well. And can I just say you're in for a treat. We're really blessed this morning. We have Pastor Gary Swenson coming to share the Word today. Many of you may know Pastor Gary was a very integral part of our church a few years ago. This man not only knows the Word of God, but he lives the Word of God. He has put decades of service into the house of God, not just here, but all across our nation. He has served Jesus so faithfully, and you certainly hear that when he shares the Word. So we are so blessed to have a friend of our house, Pastor Gary, come. So would you join me in welcoming him this morning as he comes to share the Word? Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. Good morning, Kings. Whoa, God's in the house. How many of you know God's at Kings this morning? <laughs> yeah, you weren't too enthusiastic about that. No, you are. Okay, that's good. Let me just, uh, you may be seated for a moment. I was just, um, I'm energised by the presence of God. Honestly, I am energised by the presence of God. I've just, I've had a couple of occasions and I'm standing behind the curtain there this morning deciding whether I'll preach or not. No, just standing behind the curtain waiting and just listening to and the praise and the sense of God's presence in the house. And I just felt divine energy, divine energy. And the Bible says, if the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you, He will quicken your mortal body. If you need, if you need this morning, just if you're suffering fatigue or lack of energy, be it, in your soul, be it in your body. Just stand to your feet right now. Just stand to your feet right now. If you need a divine touch of life and energy, wherever you are this morning, just stand to your feet. I want you to lift your hands to God. Father, right now, I thank You because in Your presence, not only is there fullness of joy, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. I pray this morning there would be a release of joy and divine life and energy, Your Spirit. It's within us this morning. And I pray right now for every individual in this house this morning standing. Pray for an impartation right now of divine life, divine energy, dunamis of the Holy Ghost. I pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Glenn and Noreen, where are you? Uh, down there. When you guys were praying for people this morning, I just felt you've always carried this, but... I just felt in the season ahead, there's an, in, an intensifying of God's anointing coming upon your lives of compassion, of wisdom and healing. Compassion, wisdom and healing. There's an intense, God's gonna increase that anointing and that mantle upon your life that you, you already do, but you're gonna to touch many lives. And in the days ahead, the touch of God will be even more profound and intense as God flows through you, there's a new fresh mantle, fresh anointing coming upon you. Hallelujah. Scott, I'm not just saying this because you gave me such a good introduction. Um, in fact, you could travel with me and do my intros. <laughs> Five years ago, I saw a call of God upon your life. And there's, whatever that looks like, I'm not sure. But there's a call on your life for declaration and proclamation. And when, because when you speak, there's something of God in the, the authority of the Spirit. And if you, and I know you do, but if you will take time to seek God even more and in the Word, there's gonna come revelation that will be gems. And when you, whether you're emceeing, whether you're leading, whatever you're doing, and it's not just gonna be on the church platform, but there's gonna be, it's like gold that will carry weight and authority, but it's, a, it's an anointing for declaration and proclamation upon your life, amen. Well, it's an absolute delight, it always is a great pleasure to be here. How many of you, I'm just always interested, um, how many of you have never seen me before? Give me a wave. Wow, where have you been all your life? <laughs> 
How many of you have seen me before? Oh, okay, that's, that's cool, I'm at home. Um, how many of you wish you'd never seen me before? No. <laughs> well, praise God. I was saying in the uh, early service this morning, hot August nights, whew, hot August nights. Why do we have a hot August morning? Come on, this morning. The presence of God is in the house and uh, the message I want to speak to you this morning is about creating the atmosphere for miracles. Creating the atmosphere for miracles. And uh, we've been singing about that. But before I kind of get into that, let me ask you a question. If, if I were not a follower of Jesus, if I were not a Christian, and I'm sorry, I hope I don't offend you, but I'm using the word Christian less and less, so I describe myself as a follower of Jesus. Because sadly, the word Christian has a lot of baggage attached to it out there. So I, I'm increasingly using the terminology, I'm a follower of Jesus. But if I were not a Christian, if I were not a follower of Jesus, and I were out in the world in which we live, how would I get to find out about him? What's the source that people form their ideas and their opinions of God and the church? It's largely from that world out there, social media, and it's filled with negativity, it's filled with judgment, it's filled with opinionate, opinion and negativity and and that's just the Christians. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Where should people be getting their opinion of the church and Jesus from? I want to suggest to you that it's you and me. That it's us. We are meant to be the carriers of divine life. Hallelujah. We are intended to be the carriers of the presence of Jesus. Hallelujah. In a world that's so broken and hurting. And so lost, so lost. And as the world and our culture rapidly changes, and how many of you know it is? The church has got to find ways and understand, I think, rediscover our mission and understand how to engage this crazy world in which we now live. And more than ever, we need to see and experience a fresh encounter with Jesus. It's, it's an encounter with the presence of God. I can remember during my life some of the key moments of encounter with Jesus in my life. I can remember, I can remember the day, I actually remember as a five-year-old when I made my first commitment on a Sunday night to Jesus. I can still remember it. I can remember when I was baptised in the Holy Spirit at age 14. The year before that at 13, I remember when I was baptised in water and the next week at, at school, if seriously, the sky was bluer, the grass was greener, there's something happens when you have an encounter with Jesus. Some of you this morning have had encounters, but it's been a long time. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about creating because we, we need not just for us, but we need to be able to carry the presence of Jesus so that others have encounter with His presence. See, the beauty of encountering the presence of God is that you can't argue that. <laughs> there can be all sorts of intellectual arguments and ideologies and all sorts of things, but when someone has a true encounter with Jesus, you can't argue it. You can't argue it. And we need how... We need to know and discover afresh how to press into God. I do want to say, there's a new day dawning. There is a fresh wind of the Spirit beginning to blow. I began to sense it as I travelled late last year. There's an increasing desire amongst God's people to pray and seek Him. There's a desire for the supernatural. There's a, a growing desire for the manifest and evident presence of God. Sometimes in this world, we can become very disheartened and I'm, I'm a positive person, most days. Um, I'm positive. But I've got to tell you, you know, there was middle of last year, I'm beginning to feel just from all the craziness in the world, you begin to you go, man, what's going on? God, where are you? And something's begun to shift. How many of you, by the way, how many of you uh, saw the movie The Jesus Revolution? Any of you get to see that? Wow. 
I never got to see, I was away traveling and it had a short season in the cinemas. But I'm very familiar with it. And, and I was a few months ago when that first came out. I just, it was like God put something in my heart. You got to remember that that era, and those of you that haven't seen it, it's the story of the late 60s and into the 70s was a move of God. It was, it was countercultural. In fact, it was interesting because there was a cultural revolution happening back in that time in culture generally, in Western culture. And, you know, it was, it was kind of free love. It was drug, sex, rock and roll, the whole hippie thing. There was, there was this countercultural movement which was incredibly, incredibly powerful. And I remember in that era, um, you know, as in my late teens and then into my early 20s, we used to run Christian coffee shops. Any of you ever go to, back in that era, Christian coffee shops? I don't know why we called it coffee because back then I, we wouldn't call it coffee now. Um, people would come back. For, how many of you remember uh, Pablo? Any of you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you poor man, you need a healing of the memories. Um, <laughs> International Roast, sorry if that is your favourite go-to. Um, but we used to invite, we'd go out street witnessing and we'd, we'd, in, we'd take tracks and we'd talk to people and we'd invite them back to some location, a Christian coffee shop. And I've got to tell you, and you've got to realise at that time too, there was a, a rise in occult. There was a whole lot of stuff going on and, and the, the cultural shift and that movement was a shocking to the then established culture as woke is to us now. It was, it was confronting. But in the middle of that, and this is what encouraged me and I reflected back, in the middle of that, a cultural wash that was going so against the tide of what we value and against God, in the middle of that, God showed up. I remember we would have Christian, these Christian coffee shops and people would come in and get saved. We'd have dramatic transformations and conversions. People, there would be deliverances. People would walk in and they're into occult and they're wearing some amulet or, or necklace or something and they, there'd be demonic stuff going on. Like it was crazy, but it was an incredible move of God. And what encouraged me was in the midst of a culture that's moving so rapidly away from the norms and from, from God-established boundaries, God's going to show up. God is showing up. And we are going to see in the days ahead, mark my words, we are going to see an increase in the prophetic. We're going to see an increase in the miraculous, an increase in souls being saved, an increase in healings. There is, there is a growing and rising tide. So with that in mind... How do we create the atmosphere for miracles? Hmm. There's this remarkable verse in Matthew. And it's a statement at the end of some commentary about Jesus. There's four verses and then there's this one remarkable verse. And it's remarkable for all the wrong reasons. Let me read it to you. It'll come up on the screen. It's in Matthew 13. Coming to his hometown, which was Nazareth, he began teaching the people in their synagogue and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas and aren't all his sisters with us? And where then did he get, this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. <laughs> offence culture is not new. It's just multiplied exponentially these days due to media and social media and communication. But offence culture is not new. And Jesus said to them, only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honour. And here's the verse that's remarkable for all the wrong reasons. And it says, he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief because of lack of faith. Different translations or versions put it, the message says their hostile indifference. The Passion says their unbelief kept him from doing many mighty miracles. Wow, this is Jesus. Like, 
I don't know about you, but that boggles my mind that Jesus can do anything. And yet the people in Nazareth created an atmosphere where he didn't do many miracles. I want to create an atmosphere. I don't know about you. I want to create an atmosphere in my life and in the church and the world in which I live and encounter and the world around me where God can show up and do many things, where God can do a lot of stuff. He couldn't do many miracles. They created an atmosphere, an environment where he couldn't do much. How many of you know that in life, atmosphere and environment is really important? You cannot live in the atmosphere on the moon or on Pluto or Mars. I mean, we live in this unique God-created environment and atmosphere that God has established that sustains human life here on planet Earth. It's amazing. It's miraculous. Environment and atmosphere is so, so important. At every dynamic of life, I mean, we don't think about how important it is. I love this morning, um, whoever was responsible in the, in the early service, the stage set or the screen was just like these stained glass windows and it just atmosphere, it created. And you missed a treat if you were not in the first service this morning. Chris played the harp. Oh yeah, I gotta tell you, that was, it was, there was something special and the presence of God, wow, amazing, amazing. Atmosphere is incredibly important. <clears throat> you want to have a romantic night? How many of you still remember what those were? <laughs> it's helpful to create, guys, I'm giving you some help here. It's helpful to create a good atmosphere. Turn the footy off. <laughs> sort of nice. I, <laughs> I'm sorry, Steve. I know, I know. Um, but I'm helping you. I'm helping you here. Maybe some dim lighting, some nice music. If you've got kids, send them away. <laughs> what, atmosphere. Atmosphere. I, uh, at home, I've got uh, some little plants, some herbs and things grow in my kitchen window just above the sink and some basil and some thyme and some parsley and whatever, and it's just, just nice. And, and um, my daughter, Jeanette, was over about two or three months ago and basil wasn't looking well. Um, and she said to me, she said, oh, Dad, I've got some basil at home. And she said, um, I think it probably likes a little more light, sunlight, than what it's getting there. Unfortunately, basil was too far gone. And not long after that, he passed away. <laughs> and the reason why, and I've since replaced him, uh, the, the reason was that I didn't create an environment or an atmosphere that was conducive to his growth. Now I'm talking like it's personal, his growth. Oh, wow. <laughs> First time I ever encountered atmosphere, and I told this story here once a long time ago, so those of you that heard me, the first time I ever understood the power of atmosphere was the first time I ever went to a baseball game in the United States. It's about 20 years ago. I was in LA and went with a friend, just, I didn't follow baseball, but I just wanted to go for the experience. And uh, we're at L uh, Dodgers Stadium in LA and, and if you've ever been, how many of you have ever been to a baseball game in the States or a sp large sporting game in the States here? Yeah. Man, they know how to create an atmosphere. It's, it's like state of origin here. Like the atmosphere is unbelievable and, and the noise and, you know, at the end of each innings, you know, the, there's an organ, ba 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 you know, and it's like, ah, oh, and it's incredible. And I remember at half time standing with the rest of the crowd with my hand on my heart singing, God bless America. And it's like, this thing has got me. <laughs> the atmosphere was so contagious. Atmosphere. So, so powerful. We don't realise. We can define a miracle as the intervention of God in the natural order of things. By the way, to God it's not a miracle. That's just him. That's just his nature. God doesn't go, oh my goodness, I've got to come up with a miracle. No, no, no. That's who he is. His presence is miraculous. 
His presence in itself is life-giving and creates miracles. And by the way, when we think about miracles, we, we think about miracles of healing and provision and all those sorts of things, and, and validly so. But I want to suggest to you this morning, the greatest miracle of all is the miracle of a transformed life. Because every other miracle, you can get the greatest healing you could ever have, but I've got to tell you, it's only temporary. You can have the greatest miracle of provision on your journey, and I've had them, but it's only temporary. But the miracle of a transformed life is eternal, hallelujah. And that's why we should be passionate if you're a follower of Jesus and ensuring others have an encounter with Him and with His presence because His presence transforms lives. And so we need to know how to create the atmosphere for whatever the miracle might be so that He can do a lot, not just a few miracles. But see, you got to understand, miracles rarely just happen. There's a, numbers of factors that play a part that put people in the miracle zone, if you want to call it that, follow from Old Testament right through to New. And in Nazareth, it's interesting, uh, we discover that it was, hang on, just give me a moment. I'm really, care- oh, that's good. Somebody's loosened the cap. I've had multiple baptisms. For those of you that don't, how many of you ever had one of these, these and you squeezed it while you're undoing the cap and suddenly had a shower? So in this incident in Nazareth, As we read, the people created an atmosphere where Jesus couldn't do many miracles. Incredible, incredible. Um, And we're told, of course, that it was unbelief, their lack of faith. So, I mean, what does faith look like? We know through Scripture that faith is integral. It's, It's critical to God doing the miraculous. So what does faith look like? I've got a six-week series on what faith looks like. That's the title of the series. I'm actually preaching at Pimpama this afternoon. Four will be done before then. No, 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 no. No, it's, I mean, what does faith look like? Um, I've distilled it for the sake of time and simplicity just down to two key elements that are intrinsic, I think, to faith and therefore help create the atmosphere for the miraculous. Attitude and action, attitude and action. And you will see those two things in every miraculous uh, incident through, through Scripture, that in one way or another, there is some, atti- and attitude is, can be multiple things. I mean, we, we create an atmosphere of praise. How many of you know praise is a powerful, and praise is actually an attitude. It's not just something you do. It's actually an attitude. You can sing the best praise song, but if, if your heart attitude isn't right, it doesn't mean anything. You just sing a song. So praise is an attitude, and that's one thing we know. I'm only going to touch on a couple of things of attitude this morning, but these two things, attitude and then action, doing whatever God tells you to do. And those two things are so, those two dynamics are intertwined. So in this passage in Nazareth that we read, unbelief, lack of faith, what did their unbelief look like? It's an interesting question. And as the screen has already given it away. (laughs) So one of the things unbelief looked like was familiarity. Let let me just explain why. See, they, they thought they knew him. They thought they knew Jesus. Listen, listen, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, Judas? Aren't his sisters with us? We know Jesus. And you know what? Nothing was wrong about what they knew. What was wrong was the familiarity that they had developed and and the fact that their knowledge of him was based purely on what they knew and on past experience. And for those of us who've been around for a while, I want to tell you it's very easy for familiarity. We know how God moves. We know how He does stuff. We know how it should happen. We know how churches work. We know how we know, we know, we know Him. No, we don't. No, we don't. How many of you know He's bigger 
than anything you and I know. His ways, the Bible says, are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than ours. And what they had done was that they had locked Jesus into a box based on their past experience, and none of it was inaccurate, but they put him in a box based on what they knew and what they'd seen and what they'd experienced. And the moment we do that, we lock God into a box, we, pre we present limitations to what he can do. The old saying is familiarity breeds contempt. Now, we would never be contemptuous of God, not, not consciously. But I would suggest to you that sometimes without realising it, if we've been around a while, we can lock God into a box of our experience, our knowledge and our understanding and how he does it. And he's far, far bigger than that. And the problem with familiarity is familiarity robs us of wonderment. Familiarity robs us of a sense of awe. Familiarity robs us of appreciation. And that's true at every level. For those of you here married today, man, how do you know familiarity can become just a dampener on the relationship? Because you know each other. And you become familiar. And the things that were once so wonderful is just, yeah, it's just normal. And we lose familiarity, robs us. And, and more than ever in, in terms of God and our relationship, familiarity can rob us and create limitations. And part of that was, see, we, we have preconceived ideas. Out of that knowledge, we have preconceived ideas of how God does stuff and how he does things. Again, those preconceived ideas create a very small box that we put God into. Now, one of the great things is that all miracles start, all God's miracles start with, with one thing in common. And that is that they all start with a problem or a need. Wow. Now, that's good because it means if you have a problem or a need, you're a candidate for a miracle. Hallelujah. Um, I, let, me, let me just... Maybe you're different here, but I would suggest, I don't want to insult you, but I don't think you've made it yet. <laughs> See, remember I was saying before, we think about miracles, we think about um, healing and provision and those things, but the miracle of a transformed life. How many of you know there's still some room for miracles in our life? There's still some room for some transformation. There's still some room for some stuff to happen in our lives. And uh, that's good because every miracle starts with a problem or a need. But the starting point is not just having a need or a problem. If you want to create the atmosphere, you've got to be willing to acknowledge that you have a problem or you have a need. Now, again, if it's something physical, if I've got a sore leg or a broken arm or a sore toe or whatever, yeah, that's no drama, kind of acknowledging that. It takes, but when it's something internal, if you have an issue, and I know nobody here at King's does, but that, believe it or not, there are other Christians that have issues sometimes inside. Might be a rotten temper, might be a negative critical spirit, it might be whatever. We list a hundred things. And what happens is that we are, we are hesitant to really be honest with ourselves and honest with God that we have a problem. It's always the circumstance. It's always somebody else's fault. I only said that because you... <laughs> There's still room for God to do some stuff in us. And it takes humility to acknowledge that. There's a really interesting story in the Old Testament and a uh, Syrian general called Naaman, and I won't take time to go there this morning, it's in 2 Kings chapter 5, and Naaman, the Syrian general, is diagnosed with leprosy, which is devastating and life-changing. And uh, a little slave girl witnesses to him, basically tells him, you should go and see the man of God, the prophet, that was Elisha. So long story short, Naaman takes his entourage and 
gifts and all sorts of stuff and rocks up to Elisha's house and Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. In fact, Elisha sends a servant and the servant just says to him, I mean, you can imagine, literally he rocks up at Elisha's door. The servant comes, you would think, I mean, here's a guy who's pretty important. You would think Elisha would at least come out, say hello. But no, he sends a servant and the servant simply says, Go and dip in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman is furious. In fact, in one verse there in that passage, it says he went away in a rage. Verse 11 says he went away angry and said, I thought, and listen to this, even he had preconceived ideas about how God would do what he was going to do. He says this, he says, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of, his le- of my leprosy. My goodness, he had this preconceived idea about how God would do it. Now, interestingly enough, and, and this, he also goes on to say in the passage, uh, the rivers in Samaria are better than the dirty old Jordan, better rivers in our country. I, he, there was pride. And finally, the people around him convince him In fact, they say to him, if you were asked to do some great thing, surely you would do it. Why not do this? He has to humble himself. And he goes and he humbles himself and then, which is attitude, then he's obedient, does the action in the dips in the river seven times and the moment he comes up, he is totally and miraculously healed and restored. Humility, it's an interesting, interesting concept. How many of you have ever had an embarrassing moment? If you never had, you're not living. Um, it would be so fun. I would love to do this actually sometime, but I don't pastor a church anymore. I'd just love to take the mic and go around, tell us your embarrassing moment. <laughs> I've had lots of them. And uh, embarrassment's an interesting, but one of, one of my embarrassing moments was, um, I was telling the first service this morning about this. Uh, this would be 20, 20 years ago. It was actually a, a part, guy who was past, a lovely man of God, older man, but he was pastoring on the Gold Coast here and he, uh, he wanted to catch up with me for lunch and we meet at Australia Fair and we're in the eatery and we've gone and got our food and we're sitting down at the table and there's, there's, it's a buzz, there's people everywhere and, and uh, he says grace, he says, let's say grace and I'm cool with that, that's okay. But what I wasn't expecting was he, I had my hands on the table kind of ready to grab my knife and fork. He reaches across the table and grabs both my hands and holds my hands. Now, that's okay if it's a short grace. I could handle that. (laughs) But this was not just any grace. I mean, he prayed for world revival. He prayed for missionaries in every country. I kid you not. This, And I'm sorry, but... I get uncomfortable after about five seconds of holding a man's hand. And there are people, it wouldn't be so bad in today's world, people walking past going. (laughs) Like it was so embarrassing, the sweat is beginning to run down my face. It's like, will this grace ever end? (laughs) See, grace uh, grace is an interesting, uh, embarrassment is an interesting, interesting thing. It's... um, It's a self-consciousness about something that causes us to really want to hide or hide from others. It involves, embarrassment involves our concern in relation to what others think about us. So if I were to ask you this morning, who would be prepared to come up on stage here with me and uh, this morning sing a nursery rhyme while doing a pirouette on one leg? Who Who would love to come and do that? Yeah, there's always a couple in every crowd. Seriously, it's amazing. There are always... <laughs> it'll still be worth watching, even if you fell over. Um, there's always some people... I love it. I love those people who are just, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. It's cool. Majority of you wouldn't. What if I said for 20 bucks, who'd be in then? Yeah. Oh, listen, we've already got some of the young people. 20 bucks is worth a lot more. <laughs> There's a lot of you still would not. What if I upped the ante and said $100? Still not. (laughs) He'll do it for five. (laughs) By the way, this is hypothetical, this whole exercise. (laughs) 
What if I said a hundred dollars? No. What if I said a thousand? Oh, now was oh. How many of you now? How many of you, okay? We'd give it a go for a thousand. Give me a wave if you'd give it a go for a thousand. Bearing in mind this is hypothetical, but what if I went to ten thousand dollars? The stage will be full of people. Yeah, you're in now. Hey, ten. Isn't it interesting? You see, your embarrassment has a price. Now, embarrassment is a little different to humility, but they're in the same sphere. Where we feel, for whatever reason, we don't want to expose ourselves to possible ridicule or expose our weakness or make a fool of ourselves or whatever it might be, but your embarrassment has a price. And sometimes our humility, when it comes to opening our hearts to Jesus and exposing what's in our hearts and our lives to Him, which is absolute key, and humbling ourselves, if the reward is great enough, it takes humility. See, the Bible says something really interesting. It says God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Now, I won't do it here this morning. I, I had Greg come out. Could you leap up on the stage? No, I won't put that on you. I had Greg, you'd like to see that? Okay, why do we, no. Um, I had Greg come out. We were on the lower platform this morning for the first service and I just used Greg as an example and I said, walk towards me because we want to move towards God. But if I resist him, and I did to Greg this morning, I said, whoa, 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 pushed him back. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. So I want to say that in terms of attitude, humility is one of the absolute keys to coming to God and seeing his presence touch our lives. Let me, as I draw to a close, let me... um, let me just take you to an instant in the New Testament. It kind of really makes this obvious. Talk about worth the embarrassment. Talk about Jesus. Now, Jesus doesn't want to embarrass us, but sometimes embarrassment is the thing in our own head rather than reality. So this passage in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, let me read it to you. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. How sad. I mean, no wonder Jesus is so angry. They're more worried about their religious laws than they were about the well-being of people. And so Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, So just put yourself in his, here you are with a disability, an obvious physical disability. And Jesus says to the man, stand up in front of everyone. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. How embarrassing is that? So he takes humility. Now, God doesn't expose us to everybody and we're not suggesting we should expose our weaknesses to everybody but we need to be honest with ourselves and we certainly need to be open with God but in this case Jesus says stand up in front of everybody and then Jesus goes on to actually teach them a lesson while the man is standing there with his deformity on show and Jesus teaches them a lesson. He says, what's lawful to do on the Sabbath, good or evil, to save life or to kill? And they remained silent. And he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, listen to this. He says to the guy who's already standing here in front of everybody with his disability on show, he now says, stretch out your hand. Oh, come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. I'll stretch out my good one. Happy for everybody to see the good stuff. God, happy for you to see all the good. But Jesus says, stretch out your weakness. Stretch that. That takes humility. And of course, the moment he does, he's instantly restored. A miracle happens. 
attitude and action. So for us, and I wonder if, team, if you just come back up, I'd love us to sing House of Miracles again before we close this morning. Weaknesses are reminders of our dependence upon God. Weaknesses are reminded, whatever they might be, be they physical, emotional, mental, be they stuff going on in our soul. They're reminders of our dependence upon God and our need of Him. And sometimes all God needs is our willingness to humble ourselves and not in front of everybody. We don't have to get everybody up here on stage and say, so tell us what your problem is. But sometimes we don't even respond. You know, it was so wonderful to see people coming forward for prayer earlier with needs, issues, I love that. Because that's a sign of humility. It's a sign of dependence on God. But this morning, I don't know about you, but the stuff in my life, the stuff, I see miracles of provision. I've seen all sorts of stuff, but there's still stuff God needs to do in me. And I want to create this atmosphere around my life where others can encounter the miraculous transforming power of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it just needs us to realise maybe I've become too familiar, maybe I've locked God in a box. Maybe I had preconceived ideas about how God should do stuff. Maybe, maybe we've never identified it really, but there's a pride that stops us from acknowledging and exposing our weakness to Jesus. And then to do whatever. He asks us to do, and sometimes it's a simple, it, it might be sometimes it's coming forward and not a call, sometimes it's raising our hands, sometimes whatever he, he prompts you to do. Because that stuff releases the presence of God because that's faith. That's part of the dynamic of faith, my friends. So this morning, I just, Pastor, I'm going to get you to just bow your head, close your eyes for a moment, if you would. I've been saying all morning, the greatest miracle is the miracle of a transformed life. And only Jesus is able to change and transform lives. And if you're here this morning, and I just want to give this opportunity, if you're here this morning, you've never said yes to Jesus, maybe you need for Him to transform and change your life. Maybe you've never made a decision to be a follower of Jesus or Maybe you have in the past, but you've walked away. But if that's you this morning and you need God to change your life, you need to say yes to Jesus, just to stretch out your weakness, stretch out your heart to Him. Would you just raise your hand so I can see it? I'd love to pray for you. Anybody here this morning? Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Anybody else this morning? Just, yes, thank you, I see that hand. Be it for the first time or to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. If you need God to come in and touch your life and transform your life, you want to say yes to Him. Anybody else? Thank you. Father, thank you for those hands this morning. Pray your grace. Lord, for those that, if it's the first time, let this be the beginning of an incredible journey. Let your love saturate those lives this morning. I want the rest of us just to stand all, why don't we all just stand? We're gonna sing, sing this song, thanks Ash.
want you this morning and we've had prayers. Many people came forward for prayer earlier this morning, but if you're here this morning, we're gonna close the service in a few minutes. But if you're here and you need a miracle, and maybe you need, you realize this morning there's been some stuff that's been stopping or holding back the presence and the power of God in your life. And maybe you, even as a follower of Jesus, need to come and just bow yourself humbly before Him. Maybe you've locked into preconceived ideas and familiarity. So this morning, we're gonna make time after the service is closed and I'll be happy to stay and I'm sure the team will be here just to pray for anybody else. You didn't come forward earlier, but you wanna to respond to God. It's an opportunity and maybe, maybe that's the thing you need. Maybe that's the action you need to take. I'm not saying that's, but if God talks to you, go forward. Maybe that's the action you need to do. Go and dip in the river seven times. Walk forward to the front. It's not a big deal. But sometimes it's the key. Let's just sing this one more time. And uh, come alive in the name of Jesus this morning. Come on. We want this house to be a house of miracles. We want our lives to be houses of miracles. Come on. In the name of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Thank you.